mentioned a, a very important name and uh, I, I, I have to just say that um, it got, again, spatial cognition is tied to this name. And um, Christian Frexer was a super kind and patient uh, mentor with me many, many years um, from afar in many ways, right? Because we're not in the same field, um, research field, but we touch upon in spatial cognition from different perspectives. And I have uh, learned a lot from him. And so I, I wanted to make a point of, of mentioning him. All right, so <clears throat> what it is about this wise navigation um, or smart assistant for wise navigation. So of course I have to show you these. You may have seen this in the literature called, even in the in the mass media, right? It's sort of this death by GPS idea, which is very dramatic um, and it happens and it happens as we speak perhaps somewhere in the world where we are tight and glued to our navigation devices, to our assistive devices, the phone, the smartphone, and are forgetting what's happening around us. So of course, our attention is bound um, to this device. And of course, we're looking up things. We are, we are getting help to navigate. And the more and more we use these kinds of things, perhaps the more and more we will have these occasions where we trust the system perhaps more as we trust our own eyes or we, we get into harm's way be, because we are not paying attention to what's happening around us. And so other people, of course, in this conference, at this conference over many years have worked on, on this area. And um, I just wanted to showcase, uh, take the opportunity, um, the great honor here to, to showcase a little bit what we have been thinking, um, the, the group um, I have a, a chance to, to work with. Uh, and so I, I will be presenting a little bit, a um, couple of glimpses from our side, what we have been thinking about. So, okay, if we have that phone, and in fact, someone recently told me, you know, from the car industry and, and uh, investor in the car uh, business, like, wh what do you care about, you know, working on the smartphone thing? Because, you know, we have it, so let's use it. And it's sometimes even better than we humans. So why, why, sh why should we care? Well, um, some people, again, um, from the community have worked on this. And it's going to move the controls out and about a little bit so I can see everything. Um, for example, uh, Ian Roginski uh, for his PhD at the University of Utah, uh, working together with Sarah Cream Regeer, they, they have discovered that when, when you ask people, you know, how often are you using your GPS en enabled device, um, that, that there is some relationship suggesting in this graph right here, you see um, this is the responses by the participants. And, uh, and here is a, is a test. They had to do a navigation test and then you can measure the error maybe pointing back to the original destination to the starting of the navigational route. And then, you know, you can measure this error. And it seems to, to suggest here in this graph that the more people have reported that they always rely on a GPS to navigate in space, well, they seem to have, um, oops, um, I hope you can still see. I see that the connection um, changed. Can you still see me and hear me? We can hear you, Sarah, but I can't see your slides now. Okay. I don't know why. Um, I'm still in this in the chat. Maybe I can switch up my switch on my phone and add. Um, Sarah, could you please reshare the slides? Because I just uh, just uh, disappeared. I think it's probably. Yeah, and uh, I'm not able because someone else is sharing. Oh, 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 oh. So. Um... I'll try again. So, yep, now it's free again. You should be able to see something. All right. Ah, uh, it's a wonderful assistive te technology. Okay. So, um, so this is a relationship so, su suggested here that uh, the more you use or you rely your take off your cognition to, to put it on or, or use it in with a device, then then you you may be losing your own skills to navigate, and. 
so because there is also some association of where in the brain this kind of spatial learning happens or spatial skills happen, I mean, talking about the hippocampus, and I, I know I'm talking here to the expert audience, so I'm not going to dwell on this, but there's some people suggesting, well, if, if basically, right, if, if you don't use it, you lose it, and if you do this early on in your life, then uh, what happens in, in later life, of course, you, you will be less and less able to do this uh, because cognitive resources and capacities are being reduced. And, and also there's some suggestion here by Hugo Spears and Michael Homberger that, that there may be also some indication of early onsets of Alzheimer's when you are not really training um, your, your capacities, for example, spatial abilities throughout your lifetime. And um, so here's the question, you know, as a geographer and a cartographer, what can I do here? Of course, we are not studying brains or making inferences about um, uh, brain behavior and, 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 and areas of the brain um, with behavior, but we, we are devising or designing these systems that people are using. So if we know something from, your community, our community, spatial cognition community that is interdisciplinary, can we just uh, use this knowledge to design better systems, better maps in my case as a cartographer. So we had a, an idea that, okay, and it seems that in this game, you perhaps know it, it's a game um, that tests your spatial skills, um, especially designed for the elderly. Uh, millions of people all across the, the globe have played this game. So Hugo Spears and colleagues have collected zillions of data points on uh, learning how to use this game and also how to perform with this game. And it suggested that landmarks seem to be important. And in fact, it's one of the the uh, items that people uh, that this game asks you at the end, if you have played it, you know how much you relied on the, land, on the landmarks for your navigation. And so we had this idea that landmarks maybe are important. Other people had this idea too, but here is as the view from a cartographer. So if landmarks are important, right? Well, how are they actually currently or how have they been displayed on maps? And what can we do about it? If this is an important issue in a mobile map, how can we improve perhaps the design? So here you see two examples. And some of you may be uh, too young to remember that uh, when we navigated in cities not too long ago, we used paper maps and usually tourist plans. You know, this was perhaps, you know, issued by the city of Zurich. And then they had these nice little mixed uh, display or mixed perspective maps. You have the 2D map, you have the sort of the icon or the symbol in perspective. 3D, and it actually resembles the real thing. It's sort of semi-realistic. And, and here you have this classic topographic map that you can see here. And I'm just going to use another pointer here. Um, you can see this is the, the topo map as we know it. This is the version from Switzerland. And you see also landmarks, but they're not clearly indicated. Maybe the label is suggestive of the landmarks. It's rather abstract, right? Here it's rather, there's a label and a point of interest, and it's kind of a symbolization that sort of suggests that this is an important thing that you should visit as a tourist. So there's an idea that we, what we can do as cartographers, we can rethink how we might want to represent landmarks now, not on paper maps, but on mobile maps. Of course, we have issues, right? It's a small screen, it's dynamic, it updates as we move along which are great things, um, but what makes it difficult, of course, for design. So the question is, should we do something like this? Or maybe as the current de facto standard, this is the, well, from some company, some tech company, and most people have this pre-installed on their phones. And how do they do this? Well, you can see here, they have 2D symbols. We may have points of interest, but really the landmark itself is not sort of specifically visualized. It's rather related to a business that pays money that, to show up on, on, on that map, perhaps. Then there's a 3D version. You see here that the 2D symbol is simply put on the 3D block uh, here, perspective view. And then, of course, this is more experimental, but it's rather new, and but it's going to be a de facto standard again. We have an AR display, augmented reality display, where the landmark is the real thing, and maybe some text is overlaid over it. Okay, so our idea is not just to make a map and then people get, get faster from A to B. Of course, we want to do that too, and we want to make it safe and everything. But the idea is here 
if um, the issue about learning and being able to retain your own skill over the lifetime is so critical, why don't we devise a map that helps us at least not forget uh, if we can even improve the learning even better, but at least that we can maintain the individual spatial skills, or if they are lower from the start, perhaps even improve them. So that's the idea here, what we want to do. Okay, so uh, let's see here. Um, as cartographers and designers, we may be able to change the symbolization on the map. So we have seen examples, we have seen sort of the kind of symbolic 3D perspective view of the symbol. And we have here um, seen perhaps if we move the map from the top down view, how it may look like. And then of course we can go from the continuum of highly realistic to very abstract. We have all the possibilities really in between as designers. And the question is, you know, what may work again, not just for performance of getting it from A to B, but also to remember um, how to get back from B to A again, let's say, if we lose the device, for example. So what we have tried to do is to sort of devise sort of a, a grid of possibilities of design possibilities. And you see the grid at the bottom here, you see realism on one axis and dimensionality on the other axis. And anything really in design is possible. You can imagine a completely abstract as we know it display um, with just symbols, perhaps even um, text and so on. Um, this is one corner, the zero, zero point starting corner of my grid. And then there's at the very and of course, you can even be more realistic, but you can see the idea you have maybe a mixed design with 2D and 3D. And, and of course, AR may fit here too. I'm just gonna leave this out for a moment. I'm just gonna focus, let's stay in the map world. And that this is actually a real thing. I can just show you here are these actual stimuli. <clears throat> and of course I can rotate them. And in fact, this is what we, and we'll tell you about the experiment later, uh, what we gave the people, and we can do this in 2D, we can do this in 3D, and it can rotate it, and it can zoom in and zoom out. And in fact, you can see there's also labeling and all the other stuff that you may want to have on a map. So let's say we have these two, and I do realize I'm talking to many psychologists uh, in the virtual room and cognitive scientists and so on who are, very particular about identifying in an experiment, you know, the one dimension that we want to change. Here we have, of course, a mix of things that are happening at the same time. We have realism. At the same time, we have also a mix of dimensionality. Yep, we know that. And we did that uh, on purpose. Uh, as geographers, we can do this, right? We can start with the messy world and trying to get in more and more abstract and perhaps from another perspective and field, we start with the very, 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 controlled and, and then you increase the messiness in your experiment. So this is what we did. We ran an empirical study giving a group of people, and here very importantly, and I will highlight this, it's we are interested in actually having people who are very homogeneously trained in being really high experts in, in navigation. So we took military personnel who are selected and trained for navigation and wayfinding. That's what they do amongst other things. Um, and so this was a very select subset of the population. So we're not generalizing to the general population here. We just wanted to see, even for those experts who have a very narrow field of the population, how actually will that make an effect or will that make an effect if we change the design as I showed you. One group of the, those people got the 2D map with the footprints and the other one got this mixed design, more realistic looking map. What did they have to do? They had to navigate from A to B. We work with the military to devise a scenario, a realistic one where they had to follow a route given on the display. And you actually can see it here again in small, the route is in small here. And they had to uh, go and find people in quote unquote distress in certain buildings, which is a very realistic task that they are trained for. And they had to do it as fast as they can without getting lost, of course, and, but not running, just walking. What we also did, um, we equipped these people with all sorts of 
tools. And you can see here the EEG cap um, that the participant, the participant is wearing. You see also uh, an experimenter accompanying this uh, participant, particular participant. This is Bing Jay Cheng. You will hear more about Bing Jay in a minute and also later in the week. And, um, and of course, they are uh, following the route and, and the person is navigating. So what did we do? We wanted to learn from them, how are they using the map? Um, and also, what are they attending to when they're using the map? Of course, we wanted to also to see how well they learn. And this is incidental learning. So we wanted to see, you know, as they move along, will they learn something and what will they learn? And so you can see here, we collected all sorts of um, and measures, I'm gonna move this about here. And, uh, and there are these measures that we collected. And today I'm just gonna walk, talk about visual attention. All right, so this for that, and um, let's see what happened. So again, I'm gonna focus on visual attention. And the idea here, what we're trying to do here is to see, okay, we have these different things that we are interested in, let's say a landmark in the world or a landmark on a map. We want to also know something about how they look at the map, the mobile map. So what you see here, we devised the information, the data we collected according to these discrete categories. We have here uh, the digital device. This is actually a, a, a scene from this participant and you can see the participant reflected here in the image wearing the EEG and wearing a mobile eye tracker. And this mobile eye tracker um, has a camera in front to show you know, what the scene uh, that the participant is looking at or seeing. And then of course, recording the eye movements as they go along. And we can sort of classify these eye movements into, did they look actually at the mobile map? Did they also look at the world? And here, what we do here is sort of semantically coding. So this is in the software, the eye tracking software, but you can see here, these are the landmarks that we wanted people to find. And we can then classify the video. Did they actually find the landmark? Did they look at this landmark and how often, or how long and when, and so on and so forth. We also classified uh, eye gazes that went into the environment that had nothing to do with the actual landmarks that we were interested in, just to see how are they looking at the environment and when and how long and so on. And of course, we can also classify gazes that again, land on the map. So this is how we classified their visual attention, if you wish. And then we are interested also to look at um, if there are differences in visual attention in terms of the 2D and the 3D group. Yes, we realize that we have few subjects. You can see here from the 22 that we had, we had to, this is the messy world, right? They go out, there's stuff happening and the eye tracker works or it doesn't work or, and so on and so forth. It's not a controlled lab. And so we lost a lot of data due to technology. Um, and well, this is life. And so we retained at least um, good signals from seven participants in each of the category 2D and 3D. Can we do statistics? Well, maybe, maybe not. Uh, I'm just gonna show you some of the data and um, then we'll take it from there. So here, what we can see, there's of course, large variation from these seven subjects in each category. But what we did do is just sort of qualitatively look at, well, how, how about what's the, how long did people actually fixate on the AOI classified the environment? How long did they actually fixate on the landmarks in the world? And how much did they fixate the display? Now, when we say how long, these are fixation durations. These are normalized over the trial length because they are individual trial length, of course. Uh, some people walk faster, have, are larger, uh, have, have larger, wider gates, and so on and so forth. So this is all a relative. What we can see um, without doing any statistics, well, they look really quite um, not so much, really, a little uh, on to the landmarks of interest. Uh, in the world, so risk compared to the other areas of interest. This is something to take away from, from this and not much further. Now, 
qualitatively speaking, what's happening then? What's the process perhaps that sort of suggests that the landmarks themselves are not looked at? How is the gaze actually distributed, let's say, in the world and in the map? Uh, and on the map. So here you see a kernel density surface, also known in the pub public uh, media, pub more a heat, heat map. So in GI science, this is just uh, what we say, a kernel density surface. We are looking at the individual gazes, and then we are interpolating uh, a density surface. And what we can see is that the density where it's darker, there's higher density of these fixation points. And you can see here the pattern here, and this is beautiful geography, right? This is what we can do very easily in GI science. We can look at patterns, we can quantify patterns, we can compare patterns, um, spatial patterns, and we can see here qualitatively, there's maybe something going on in that here in the 3D group, people seem to have more concentrated gazes on the actual landmarks. And here in the 2D group, there seems to be a wider spread in terms of um, the, um, the, the distribution of the fixation. So let's have a look at this. How can we actually further investigate this? So what we can do, we can say, okay, let's now, you see these again, the environment AOI, the landmark in the world, and the map AOI. Let's add another AOI that we want to look at. And that is the landmark shown on the map. So these four we can add, analyze in terms of perhaps, let's say, first, some transitions. We are interested to see if they look at landmark in the map, do they look then at landmark in the world? Or they just spend time looking more on the map, or they actually uh, look more into the environment. So what you can see here is a, is a map again. Um, it's a grid. You have on this uh, y-axis here, the landmark in the world on the map, you have the environment and you have the map display itself. And we are literally looking at some jumps. If I look at the map, what's the probability that I keep looking at the map? This is what this square does. If I look at the environment, what's the probability if I look first at the environment, where, where would my gaze go next? Will it go on to the map? it's a very low probability. So high numbers up to one is highest probability and zero is lowest probability. So we have here zero to a hundred percent in essence of jumps from one AOI to the other. What can we see here? We can see that there seems to be a diagonal but missing this square here. So mostly people are actually spending time on that AOI and returning to the same AOI. So if I look at the map, I am more likely to say on the map, and this is what the diagonal suggests. Any other movement here means that there's transition between any of the other um, AOIs. What's interesting is that, well, I can do this also for the 3D case and I can see Graphically speaking, they're very, very similar, aside from one AOI, this one here. So if you are on the landmark on the map, what's the probability that you say are again looking at the landmark on the map? And you can see here, um, it's rather low. And here, it's rather high. So we have qualitative differences between just visualizing the landmark differently. And then we can start and trying to understand, well, what does that mean actually? So what we can also do these transition matrices, we can do this from all the individuals and then we can aggregate and do averages of all the individuals. And we can further summarize this pattern in terms of one value in terms of saying, okay, this behavior here, how can we classify it? If let's say um, there is a diagonal, it's mostly dark, mostly, you know, predictable that they keep staying on the um, on the same AOI, or actually rather they are moving about between AIs away from the diagonal to look at other things. And in a summary, we can say, what is this transition matrix? What is it saying? Is it co complex movements? Is it simple movements? Um, is it um, predictable uh, movements? And here we can summarize it with the so-called transition entropy, a summarization here saying that actually 
um, if you compare these two uh, transition matrices overall, you can say, is, are there many gay switches happening or not? And we can do this overall, and we can do this also across conditions. And you can see here that the 3D suggests that there seem to be a bit more transition um, across the, the different uh, AOIs. Similarly, or conversely, if you will, um, there's another um, suggestive measure that talks about the stationary entropy. So we're here we're interested in saying, well, how are you if this is complex, if, if the prediction here is hard because it's just random, basically, there are lots of this randomness in this pattern. And so 3D seems to be slightly a bit more random than 2D, but how can we also classify this pattern in terms of the, um, the, the, the gaze style? Is it more focused on a, a couple of few AOIs or is it evenly distributed across all AOIs? And here it suggests that on uh, the 3D actually, that the, um, the gaze transitions are more evenly distributed across the AOIs. We can interpret this in this way that we can say, well, perhaps the 3D helps people actually not only focus on that map and that landmark on the map, but turn the gaze back into the environment. And this is probably something we want. We can also then look or model this behavior in terms of uh, spatial learning, which we also collected. So if we have uh, people looking at some AOIs, let's say the environment, how is it, how does it relate to uh, the pointing, we saw this earlier, JRD, right? So higher pointing error is worse learning and lower pointing error, JRD, just um, judgment of relative in this case, both we have distance and direction. Let's look at, at direction here. Um, how does this actually uh, relate to? Um, and you can see here, it suggests that if people spend more time looking at the environment, you see the arrow is going down both for 2D and 3D. And how about this other um, landmark AOI, landmark in the world, you can see here is much steeper, right? So first of all, we know already they look far less on the AOI for the landmark in the world compared to the environment. But you can see here, if they look at that landmark, that relevant one, it's even more steep, but, but you can see here it's in the same direction. So um, the more they look here, the better they learn, the smaller the error. And here comes the kicker for a cartographer. Oh, how sad, right? Um, if you think of the display itself, irrespective of the landmark, um, well, the more you spend time looking at that display, it seems to suggest that um, you're not learning well. In fact, in your error increases. So you can see there's a switch of the direction of the relationship. We know it's few people. Um, and here we actually modeled all 22 uh, in terms of a, a linear uh, mixed effects model. Um, so this is sort of an idea for us to, to move forward. OK, am I, how, how am I doing in terms of time? Uh, we started a little later, but um, I will just continue on, I guess. Um, you're, you're doing fine, Sarah. OK, thank you, uh, Ruth. So this is about display design. That's the, you know, the heart of the cartographer's uh, uh, sort of existence, right? We want to create wonderful maps. And we realize as cartographers more and more, obviously through uh, the, the work that is coming out of this community, that we need to look at the human more, more often and more closely. And this is what I would like to share now. And so before I do that, um, to showcase that this work is really interdisciplinary and many fields are touching upon these ideas that I'm presenting here. I want to highlight a special issue coming up in Spatial Cognition and Computation Journal. It's going to be on geographic information, human computer and navigation. And uh, Ian Roginski and, and colleagues um, have put together a what I hear, uh, Ian, you will uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I hear this, this is going to be a fantastic um, special issue coming out this year, as I was told. So you see, um, we need to look at many perspectives of the problem. So now let's focus a little bit more on that human and also on the context. 
just to give you an idea, um, this is from Ruth uh, Rosenholz and colleagues at MIT. So they have been modeling uh, visual attention and, and uh, gazes and sort of suggesting it's not only about where people look in terms of the focal area, but also about peripheral vision. And this is a, a model here. You can see the person, the driver is focusing here on the road, how they should. And the question is, what do they see of that display? And it's actually, Ruth is making the point is more than we think, uh, even if it's not perfect uh, in terms of just peripheral vision. And so this is the model output that suggests actually they're not seeing the details of the display. Um, they're getting some of the idea of what's happening here or what's, what's over here, uh, given uh, that they're not focusing on the display, they shouldn't, um, but it's more than we think. But it's important to know that of course, what they see will also be depending on the context. And this is what I also would like to talk about because this has been also something in my community, um, realizing everything related to mobility, movement, behavior, and so on, the context really matters. So here is a, a bit of a, a glimpse in, into what we are doing. Here I want, would like to showcase, before I showcased Arman Kapai, uh, uh, PhD work and, and Armin I think is in the chat so you can ask him all sorts of questions and he will be answering much better than I can and here I would like to showcase Bing Jie Cheng's work who will be also speaking in the conference later on so what Bing Jie and colleagues want to do given that okay landmarks seem to be important given that we can do something in terms of design um, we can visualize it in different ways but in this case um, Bingji is interested to know if we can modify the density of the landmarks, sort of the question, you know, how many landmarks should the display actually have? This is, would be considered a very dense cartographic display, right? And so Bingji is asking, how can we adapt landmark information, not only just sort of to our aesthetics and, and sort of appreciation, but basically based on individual's cognitive load, and not only just you know sitting on a sofa and looking at an atlas and drinking some wine, but really while people are moving about in space. And again, this idea is related not just to performance, so people will get faster from A to B. It's in this case again related to can people also learn something or actually not forget or not unlearn what they have been learning over the years, right? To be able to self-localize. Uh, once perhaps the display is not working anymore. So here's a couple of ideas um, that Bingji is saying, okay, let's say if we were to measure cognitive load in some way, maybe through uh, the EEG that we saw earlier, um, there may be sort of a, a cognitive load spectrum from low to high. And at some point the person, you know, will be stressed out or because of context, will have less resources available to look at the map. So depending on this, can we modify the design in terms of landmark density? So this is basically uh, one idea. So here you see Bingje um, sitting uh, in a cave, uh, what we call a cave, a 3D um, projection system. It's immersive, it's stereoscopic, it has three walls. You can see one wall here, here, and over here is hidden. And um, our participants are actually sitting in Bing Jay's worlds that she created, I will show in a minute. And what we can do is again, similarly to the outdoor study, we can record the EEG. Um, we potentially could look where they look, but we didn't look, uh, didn't use any eye tracking here, but they are interacting with the world. There's a wand the system here, and they're also moving about in the world using this game controller with their feet so to be able to navigate. So in this case, again, it was a navigation study, just find the, the, uh, the destination, follow the route, and then they, you, something happens on the screen. So and I will show you in a minute what that is. So here you see that world that Bingje created using GIS capabilities is just a, a world to navigate in. It has different roads and different buildings. And of course, there's some landmarks will be shown in there. And the landmarks actually were very similar to Armand's study, right? We have a, a route here they have to follow. And then there are these landmarks. They are placed strategically either at an intersection or not. 
And in this particular case, um, because of control, we um, showed people a map. So they had to navigate from A to B. They were told to learn. And then at this moment, before the landmark, before any landmark, before they turned, um, the map was shown so to, to help them look at the map to see where they are. And then they pass the landmark, the map is shown again, and then they move about. And after they turn, the map is shown again. So um, this is how we controlled uh, also to be able to see they have to look at the map. And, and then we wanted to know what that relationship is between looking at map. And you can see here, this is an example of the view. The map is projected onto the world. So the world goes away, basically. And then they know where they are. They know which landmark they're looking at. And then they're turning. OK, so this is what we did. Um, There's, of course, a procedure. I'm not going to go into detail, but we did all sorts of things that we need to do to control everything. Uh, we wanted to know how much they learn. We wanted to also know how well their capacity of learning is. And also we wanted to think a little bit about, well, uh, aside from spatial ability, is just generally cognitive capacity measured in some way? Is it important um, to be able to do this task well? So we use the Corsi block and adaptation of the Corsi block to, to study um, so-called span or working memory span. OK, so oh, I maybe have to go back just to show um, that we actually uh, recorded performance, but we also recorded spatial learning in terms of the landmarks. Did they see them? Did they correctly identify them? Um, did they know where they turned or how they turned at the landmark and also some judgment of relative um, this, uh, direction. And so just to give you a little bit, bit of a glimpse, again, I'm trying not to give too much away because uh, Bingxie will tell you herself what she's been doing. Um, you can see here, we wanted to know were they able to correctly, we give them landmarks to look at and then we wanted to know if they correctly could identify the ones that they actually saw. Um, and so this is sort of uh, in terms of a hit task. Uh, we said, you know, did you, uh, there are a series of landmarks that you identified, that's a hit. Correct identification is a hit. Um, and also correct the rejection, uh, you know, correctly looking at false alarms um, is, is, uh, is in terms of information gathering. We can use this to sort of study how well they actually learn the landmark. So here we see, the um, correct uh, landmark detection, what we call a HIT in a signal detection framework. That's how I was thinking of the name. Here we go. Um, and so we have three conditions, so three different cities, and, and they were was within. So um, they had a condition with three landmarks to learn, one with five, one with seven, so all randomized and so on. But you can see here, best would be best 100% you know, correct identification of seen landmark. And you can see no one is best, but they are quite high here. Um, and you can see here three is the not so high, but then five and seven um, is higher and, and, you know, and nothing is happening between five and seven. As a sort of corollary, we have the false rejection rate, the FAR. So in this case, right, they should be correctly rejecting as well, not just correctly identifying, but correctly rejecting. And they're doing it very well here, you can see. Um, so best learning would be correctly rejecting. So low here, here would be best learning would be correctly identifying. So these two measures, we can combine them in the signal detection framework, and we can look at discriminability. So D prime, so we take uh, the normalized score of the hit minus uh, the, the disease scores of the false alarm. And then we can identify you know, how well they are able to discriminate between you know, things that they've seen and they have thus learned and things that they have not seen, so the reject distractors. And we can see here, it's kind of uh, re resembling the hit rate, you know, it's like three is over here. And then they're doing better with five, learning more with five or being more discriminable, I guess it would be the English world word. And then there's not much happening. So seven doesn't really add much, we can say. And in terms of parsimony, we'd say, okay, five seems to be sort of the sweet spot in terms of this um, 
uh, graph. Um, and we can do this for the route, right? Um, so we can tell them, here you are, did you turn left, did you turn right? Of course, uh, in a meaningful, this would not uh, be uh, now a meaningful trial here, but just to give you an idea, right? We can do the same for the route. And here we can also see very similar, three maybe not enough perhaps to learn, but five and seven uh, people are doing better here. Okay. So to uh, sort of bring this home, why are we doing all this, um, right? So the idea again here is to sort of find a way to help navigators um, learn while they are moving about in space, they will go from A to B, they have to do meet the, this demand, right? But also we want them to not sort of train them as they go, if you like. And so the idea here would be to have um, a relationship perhaps be, between cognitive load in terms of context, right? There's some cognitive load going there, talking to people, they're looking at their, their watches, that they have to maybe change trains and have a look at schedules and so on. So there's some cognitive load happening. And as travel distance con you know, continues um, or increases, this may increase because they are also seeing many more landmarks. And of course, more information is accumulated over time to a point where perhaps cognitive load is just exceeding their capacity, the individual's capacity, working memory span or other kind of cognitive capacity. And at that point, perhaps it's time for the map to do something. Maybe the map could reduce the information density uh, because we cannot do it. Uh, we are not planners like Ruth. She's an architect. She can start removing buildings perhaps, but we can. So we can change the map perhaps. And helping people just to maybe highlight the relevant information and remove the irrelevant one based on the individual's cognitive load and the task and the context. And, and therefore, that may be helpful um, also for spatial learning. So Bingji has a sort of a, an idea that perhaps her neuroadaptive system may be better for spatial learning yet to be shown. Um, this is what the PhD is about. But if you want to know more about this, um, I highly encourage you to visit Bing Jay at her poster on Wednesday. Uh, and she will be able to tell you much more because of course she also has some insights about her EEG data uh, that she can uh, share with you. So this is, um, stay tuned. All right, so for now, um, sort of <laughs> honing in into the finish line here. So we can see that um, we, have wearables, they are here. People have designed them um, for various reasons, um, but probably not to keep in mind that we want to learn as well as you know getting quickly from A to B. So we want to think about perhaps in the future um, to sort of take advantage or leverage developments also in other fields. And here I'm just showing you one example, right? I mean, of course, I didn't talk about AR. We don't know how well actually people can do this and navigate and how useful it is for learning. And um, there, there are devices now that allow us to leave the lab. Um, here's just one, just one device here, right? It's like you can record people's uh, EEG, so to speak. Uh, brain activity, there are uh, devices allowing us to, of course, in real time, look at um, how where eyes move and how the, the pupils change based and, and sort of ideas about cognitive law related to papillometry. Um, we can measure, um, and we haven't talked, but our group is also looking at how emotion plays a role in navigation. So if you're going to GI science, um, maybe then uh, you may hear a bit more of that. Um, and of course, uh, with the smartphones, we can easily record body movement, accelerometer data, and so on and so forth, and heart pulse and so on, is also uh, directly available in, in mobile devices and in fact used in other capacities. But we can think about learning more about the humans uh, as they move about to, to design then better, um, more useful interfaces, perhaps, to not only get from A to B, but also to not lose our capacities uh, to self-localize and navigate. So to summarize, um, we do know now from um, prior research, uh, including Tori Shikawa, Ian Ruginski, and others who have shown that in fact, 
the more people use uh, these smart navigation devices. Um, it comes with a cognitive and perceptual costs, usually loss in a way. Um, we now have maybe a chance to connect the devices to individuals uh, sort of signals. If I'm talking here about not remote sensing of the earth, but remote sensing or even close sensing of the human. So we can look at how people use these systems in the wild. We can measure um, quantitatively and qualitatively um, the interactions with the world um, and the device, and even uh, looking at people's attitudes and emotional states, cognitive states, perceptual states, even almost um, now really um, in real time. And the idea is maybe that we can use this information to have systems adapt to our cognitive states, um, our performances, our prior knowledge and the use context so that we actually not only get fast and securely from A to B, but actually that we once we want to put away that device uh, in a national park, or if we lose it somewhere, we actually uh, don't lose our capacities to move by ourselves. I have not mentioned Sara Lanini Maggi, uh, aside from the people that did mention who are part of this research project. And uh, of course, many other group members who in the various capacities have supported this research, including past PhD and postdocs from the group, um, Sasha Kade, Anina Brücke, and Tyler Thrash, who have been instrumental. And I think I saw Kai Florian Richter um, uh, in the group. And of course, I want to also acknowledge Kai Florian, who has shared his navigation knowledge with us for many years. So with that, I want to stop. And I'm thrilled to getting many questions from you. Thank you very much. That's great, Sarah. Um, I've no idea what the um, virtual protocol for giving a round of applause, but if anyone would like to put their microphone on and... Uh... Thank you very much. Um, so in terms of questions, um, if no one's ever used Zoom before, uh, there's a little button at the bottom that says reactions. If you click on that, you can put your hand up and I will call on you to um, give your own question. Um, but if for whatever reason you're unable to, you know, your microphone's not working or you're in a busy office somewhere, unlikely, but you never know, uh, feel free to put your, type your question into the text and I will read it out on your behalf. So, you know, anyone that wants to um, ask your own question, um, put your virtual hand up. I might actually miss you doing a physical hand uh, or feel free to type a question in. Um, but I will kick off. Um, while everybody's thinking about what question to ask. And Sarah, I'm going to play a little bit of devil's advocate here. Um, Please. Do you think that people, um, the general public, actually want to be wise? Or do you think that many people would actually prefer to be, uh, shall I say, non-wise and simply offload all of this onto the machine, let the machine do it for them, and use their attention for much more fun things than navigating around? Of course, and I would be the first to do that too, right? Uh, of course, Ruth, you, you're pointing to a very key issue. Um, it, it's always uh, like food, right? We love foods that are not healthy for us and we should know better, right? And so I guess my answer would be, it's true until until the very fact where, of course, I don't want to use these dramatic examples of people dying in a, in a national park, right, because of the, the following a GPS. But even the small idea of, oh, I'm walking about, I'm going and see a friend's house, uh, a friend at, a, at their house, and then, then I'm losing my keys. And this is Anina's uh, great examples of her work. Um, you know, and then um, I have to backtrack and find my keys. And I better really have paid a little bit of attention of where I walked, even if it's in an unknown environment, you know, and we have this kind of idea in when hiking, you know, we were told uh, in school, in Swiss schools, uh, when you were hiking in the mountains, always occasionally look over your shoulder, look back on the track so that you see how the track looks when you come back so that you have an idea. So, so it's clear that, um, yes, I, I'm, we, will be help, we will be happily offloading our cognition. Same with calculators. I, if I have a calculator, I will not calculate in my head. 
But in certain circumstances, we, we really, even if people may not know and they're using my device, let's say of the future, I, I will help them in the case something happens like that. And then they will be maybe not noticing that we have held them all along the way. So the idea is if we can build this into a system, they use the system, great. They use it in the car, they use it as uh, bicyclists and so on. If we can build this in sort of underneath, under the hood, you know, and then we help them. So that's kind of my, my uh, chickening out response. <laughs> That's great. Thank you, Sarah. So we've got a couple of questions here. First, and I apologize if I get your if I if I'm not pronouncing your name correctly. I think it's Vintisa. It's um, my surname. My surname uh, is Agni. My name is Agni, but that's fine. Agni. Okay. So yeah. we'll have Agnia's question and then I'll read Bob's question from the right. text. Hi there. Uh, Agnia, I, I you. think you're on mute. There you go. Sorry, not good at Zoom. Anyway, um, this is, yeah, very wonderful. I um, I have a question about, I, I, I'm referring to one of the first graphs where there was, you know, the kind of uh, zero sum game between, you know, if you use more of these apps, you kind of lose mm -hmm. your own skills at um, mm -hmm. navigating. Uh, I was thinking, is there maybe at some point at which using so these types of visualization tools could actually help you to, if you don't overdo it, to help you learn navigation, just to have, you know, frame of reference, a perspective, mm -hmm. maybe, yeah, just a tool to visualize. And then, um, you know, instead of replacing everything you do with these apps, just to use it mm -hmm. for a while. And yeah, no, uh, this is the, the graph probably you, you're referring to it just uh, as a reminder. Um, yes, I mean, this is this idea of, of the map, right? I mean, it's a cognitive offloading device and the map, the paper map, I have to say, has this incredible capacity to have this large screen thing in front of you and you can fold it and you can put it in your pocket, but when you unfold it, it's this huge thing why it is huge, why this, this is important to be large, it's because I can see something of the world, of the footprint, of um, beyond of what I can actually see, and I can see the relationships um, in, an, in another perspective. So there's a perspective change, which may be difficult for some people, and some people in this community have shown this, um, but at least it gives you some context of where I am in the world with respect to other things, and that is really um, what the map gives us and why this is, you know, we have 5,000 years of history of cartography, right? I mean, there's a reason why we have it. And so this is a, this idea, right? We, it's not about replacing it or getting rid of it, um, but it's actually this particular aspect of mapping is critical to see this kind of, the graphic helps me to learn something about the environment where which otherwise I couldn't, right? Especially beyond personal direct visual experience. And so I agree with you that the, these, it's not about replacing them or getting rid of them. They're here anyway, they, they will be here, here to stay. They may be even then later on my retina, who knows? Um, but it's the idea that let's optimize them or, or, or merge best of all worlds. So that, that was the idea. And, and thank you for that, absolutely. I mean, I didn't want to make that point that we you know, mm -hmm. no, should get rid of thank it. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. That's great. Thank you. So I'm going to read a question out from the text now, which is a question provided by uh, Bob Colvord. Um, mm -hmm. He's asking you, Sarah, for your work with military members, how much do you think their familiarity or experience with 2D navigation support, so maps, smartphones, etc., impacted your results? Uh, hi, Bob. <laughs> Long time no see. Uh, hi there. Um, Yes, of, of course. I mean, we cannot make any generalization to the general population. That's, you know, clearly. Um, how much did they impact? It's interesting because what we did find, right? I mean, we were, we uh, interviewed them. We had um, long interactions. We also devised the, the design of the experiment and so on. And um, we were told, right, they have a training and every one of these uh, highly selected members um, have a go through training. 
map training. And of course, we would expect there are experts, but within the experts, as we know from individual differences, there is a range. So even if we say it's experts compared to the general population, and I'm looking at Armand, and Armand may have a, something to say here, uh, much more in, intelligible than I do, but you know, the idea is that these experts are not a very, they are homogeneous in terms of compared to the, maybe the general population, but within themselves, there is variation. And we want to say, you know, we, we really speak about these experts and it's a small sample and, and we realize we cannot make any generalization to the general population. But Armand is now ready to run a new experiment with, uh, you know, the usual undergraduates or graduates where that we have access to. And the same thing here, right? We have results in the, in the published world where we make uh, statements about spatial cognition and it's usually typically the, the the school population, you know, the student population. So appreciate your, your comment. Absolutely. Maybe you have a follow-up. Sarah, if, if, if I could, and, and thank you for a wonderful talk. I, I guess my question is more about the, the sort of ghost of the experience we all have with 2D because of smartphones and for the older of us maps and how we can ever sort of control for that experience as we extend mm -hmm. to 3D. I, and maybe the answer is, is you just have to live with it. And I, I'm fine with that answer. It just yeah. struck me as a, an interesting curiosity. Yeah, you're you're absolutely right, because the military is training on 2D and paper, right? I mean, this is why we have the Swiss Topo. Swiss Topo's existence is because of the military, right? These maps are devised, and of course, not those that we have access to. They have other ones, um, different ones we don't have access to. But of course, you in this case, you're right. They are, they are trained onto the 2D map, specifically the Swiss topo maps uh, or, or any other that they have when they go to actually, these people are going uh, for his, uh, peacekeeping missions. So satellite maps from, from uh, uh, the, various, the various sources. So yes, um, I can only say I agree with you. That's very true. And those that population is also a bit older than the usual student population and they're more likely to have been trained and using maps uh, for a longer time and we have i have anecdotal evidence to so I, I teach uh, a spatial cognition seminar together with bing j cheng who's also in the in the in the chat here and we were surprised to hear when we told the students there was a student uh, 20 30 students and they were like who in their right mind would use a paper map today? We all use, you know, Google Maps. I mean, that's literally what someone said. So appreciate what you comment on. That's great. Thank you, Sarah and uh, Bob also for your questions. So I think we now have a question from uh, Annette Hohenberger, if you'd like to give your question. Yes, hello. Um, just Hi. to put myself in space, um, I'm from University of Osnabrück in Germany. I also, Hello. Yes, I also have a follow up question about the sample since you uh, mentioned in parentheses that there were only two women um, in this sample. Mm -hmm. um, I felt uh, that I might ask about whether you have it on your mind that the gender have differences in the way they orient in um, space. So um, maybe for the future, is that something um, that you would like to address having special, let's say, um, inbuilt um, helpers to, to navigate around, um, especially for men versus women? This is always the question is like <laughs> um, gender, right? In the, for cer certain tasks, of course, uh, female will be better than male, and for other tasks, male will be better than female. And of course, yes, if we are thinking, as I made this point, you know, looking at not only individual differences, but group differences. Of course, we should also consider that or the young versus the elderly, and that will be another group difference. Um, so age ranges and so on. Um, absolutely, yes, uh, one could do that. We uh, and Armand and Bingje, you correct me, I don't think, and unsurprisingly, for this particular task, I don't think, um, and you immediately correct me, Armand and Bingje, sort of important gender differences, also because we have this small sample. And also, of course, this is a highly skewed sample for the military case. But I don't think that we have even found, even those 
that we would expect like JRD differences, they're, they're known, but well, we didn't even find them. Is that correct? Armand, just feel free to, to correct me. I don't want to um, say something wrong. Well, in, in my, thanks for the question though, everyone. And in, in my case, I, we didn't look much into gender differences because we're actually, we have only like very limited sample size and that's not because of us, but it's also because of the availability of the group and what we can get out, out of that group. But no, it's, at least so far, we didn't look into gender differences, at least in my case. But who knows, probably it might be, an, it might be a case for the future experiment that will have a broader and more general population that we might consider as well the gender differences. And at least I, take a look into them. Yeah, and I, I have to say we did controls, you know, for so we use these spatial ability and in, in certain cases, not what I showed today. Uh, we use this as controls, of course, knowing of the literature that there are for certain tasks, gender differences or spatial ability differences for certain tasks, we do uh, control for that, let's say. Uh, but that's not in this particular research. I, I'm looking also at Bing J. Yeah, Bing I yeah I look uh, look at the gender differences. So in my experiment, I had uh, forty uh, eight participants and with more balanced gender uh, population, and I didn't find any gender differences. Yeah. Also, I look at the age difference. Even though I have like a the age ranges from. Uh, 18 to uh, 35, and I didn't find any like uh, differences in terms of age either. Yeah, if it's kind of like an answer to your question. Thank you, Bingji. That's great. And uh, thank you, Aneta, for your question. Nora, Thanks. I believe that we have a question from Nora, and then I'll read out Maria's question from the test. Oh, Nora, now I'm getting very uh, worried. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. Um, Hi thank you. That was great. It's such a different perspective. And uh, I did want to qu quickly mention about gender differences that in a recent meta-analysis, we did find gender differences overall, but they're not enormous. Um, they're not nearly the size that the mental rotation differences are in navigation. They're maybe a third of a standard deviation. And they're also, as far as we can tell, not present for children under the age of 18. So that just gives a wider perspective. Of course, you know, as we add more data, like Bing G or whatever, who knows, the results could change. But yeah. Um, but my question for you is that um, I think one of the sort of challenges in this area is aggregating data over labs. It's something that a lot of us have been very concerned about over paradigms, over dependent variables, over virtual environments um, to create larger samples so that we can better address some of the questions that we want to address. And, um, you know, if we're trying to launch an effort of that kind to establish some, you know, commonalities, um, what would your recommendations be? What would your thoughts be about how the community would proceed in that endeavor? Actually, I, this is a fantastic idea. Um, we, we are now just thinking about, right, open science and open frameworks and sharing our designs and so it's it's a really I, I would have to think a, a moment to to think about this very to give you really a a thoughtful answer i think it's a fantastic idea um we even we just had a discussion this morning just to give you a, an example of how we con we are concerned about this is um being just used the core c block um manipulation in, in her design and we were trying to find actually what is the data distribution of a Corsi block task and then there's a review paper we find with many different Corsi block um, applications different stimuli different conditions different everything basically and it's very hard even to know what the data should look like in this particular very well studied task we were very surprised so we Bingje contacted some of the authors, uh, at least one author, to find out, you know, am I looking for a normal distribution here? Or what should I be seeing so that I can trust my, my Corsi block? So I, the only thing I, I would say is I would love to be participating in something like that because I think it will help uh, not only 
us, but the future generation to make sense, not only of the design and, and the manipulations, and but also even what does the data look like when I record it? Uh, and how is, for example, my eye tracker affecting something like my, my uh, AOIs? Even that, I mean, we are reliant on the, uh, on the, uh, the vendors of these systems to be able to make sense. And often they do not divulge actually the, 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 the detailed information. So we don't know, even if you're using the same eye tracker, we don't know exactly, you know, dwell time fixation. We had this discussion this morning, dwell time fixation duration. What's the difference? And how do we conceptualize it? And what, how do we, you know, how can we share it across uh, the different studies? So I, I would find this through the Silk Network would be a perfect network to do it. That's great. Uh, thank you, Sara and Nora, of course. Um, we have one question from the text, um, Sara, and it's from uh, Maria Fotiu. And she says, have you considered including hormonal levels for gender differences? And she says that some studies refer to the fact that hormonal levels influence the ability to solve spatial tasks. Actually, we had, and I'm looking to Kai Florian. Kai Florian was supervising um, with, together with Arthur Cheltikin, uh, uh, a study where we had someone, um, our, our master's student, looking at uh, animated um, visualization of navigational route. Uh, Kai Florian, you correct me, or you can speak to that actually, where in fact, saliva was collected. Correct, but we only had one gender, for example, due to the differences in hormonal levels, as, as the, the other party at least claimed that. So it was together with, who was uh, it? Carmen Sandy. Precise, yes, it, right. It, it's, uh, it's, anyway. Yes, so so I think we, we collected the saliva for for anxiety essentially whatever they did in, in the analysis. So I mean I'm I'm certainly quite remote from these kind of analyses like like you are. So so but I mean in that study we explicitly excluded women essentially or the, the student decided to to take male engineering students to be even more precise um, and 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 restrictive mm -hmm. to kind of trying to limit all kinds of influencing factors, right? So, so like hormonal levels, um, mm -hmm. which she didn't test for in, in the male participants. So we don't know for yeah. them, but yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's to say, of course, uh, I mean, we have not done it. And I, I certainly would not dare, uh, you know, going to the direction already, uh, EEG, you know, I'm, I'm being educated by uh, Bing J. Cheng and colleagues, I would like to know, uh, also mention Klaus Graman, who's been instrumental in helping us and making sense of the EEG data. So um, for sure, with, with experts, uh, why not? Uh, but myself, I, I wouldn't dare even go close that that route and in this particular master's thesis also common sandy she's an expert in this domain and, and she actually did the the analysis um, but of course uh, interesting interesting uh, uh, avenue uh, that i haven't uh, considered can i just briefly say that the hormonal literature to summarize i would summarize it is a mess <laughs> i don't think people should go there now is there something happening? Maybe there's enough clues that something possibly quite complex. It has not been done much with regard to navigation. It's mainly with these small scale paper and pencil. But if you want to look for some summaries, email me. I can tell you what it is. But in my view, this is at this point not a promising research direction. <laughs> Thank God, one headache less. <laughs> Thank you, Nora. I think, um, Agnia, your hand was up briefly. Did you have one last question? Uh, no, that was not a raised hand. Those were applause. Um, oh, okay. so. Well, I think we possibly do have time for one last short I think question. David has something. Information about the Silk Network can be found. Thank you, David. And this is a fabulous resource we have uh, taken advantage of. And now we need to update, actually. That reminds me we need to update our information. That's great. Well, if we don't have any other questions, I'm going to sneak in one very last quick one. Um, Sarah, you were talking about non-digital 
being 2D maps. But of course now we have access to 3D printers. So presumably it would be possible to 3D print a really nice lightweight physical 3D map. Is that something you might consider doing? If it's foldable, immediately. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, I mean, it's true. I mean, uh, we haven't even considered, you know, all the technical possibilities. You can even imagine, you know, having a, um, a 2D map where you wear your glasses and it projects, of course, in an AR, AR sense, it projects 3D landmarks. You could have, and that's already possible today. Um, what the physical would bring, not sure. Again, it's not not very sort of, it doesn't fit in my backpack, probably. <laughs> That's brilliant. Well, I think we'll draw that to a close now. And I think uh, everyone will agree that that was a really fascinating, stimulating talk, a great way to kick off the conference. Um, if people would like to put their microphones on again and give Sarah one last round of applause. Thank you very, very much. Thank you for your thoughtful and hard questions. Looking forward to the conference. Great. And um, the next session uh, starts at um, uh, 20 minutes to, so 40 minutes past the hour, depending where in the world you are, which gives everyone time for a little bit of a comfort break. Mm-hmm. <sighs>